guess you could say, all the way up to around 2010, video games were still undeniably a worthwhile pastime. And it's interesting to see a lot of younger gamers kind of going back and they want to discuss these games of this era, they want to play them, they want to experience them for themselves. And I guess the very healthy emulation scene these days is a testament to this. That's not to say that, you know, quality video hasn't been released post-2010, but, you know, gone are the days where you would have multiple AAA releases coming out every single year that would be, you know, 10 out of 10s. And that used to be commonplace because the level of innovation, the level of freedom, a virtually pure meritocracy, that is what gave the golden age of gaming its character, in my opinion. So much variety, so much diversity of ideas, you know, as in the actual definition of diversity, not the neo-Marxist definition, which is basically just a dog whistle for anti-white, anti-Western. We're talking about an actual variety of perspectives from creators across the world, from the US and Europe to Japan, young creators in a budding industry of technology and art, you know, fused together, able to just do their own thing. There were no woke ESG mandates. There wasn't a political monoculture that had to be paid tribute to before creators could actually access the market. Edgelords are making games, libertarians are making games, you know, Shinto Buddhists are making games, occultists, even Christians. I mean, come on, I'm Doug Tenepal. Instead of being cancelled, he's in his element. He's making Earthworm Jim, he's creating weird experimental point-and-click games like The Neverhood, and this is what it was like before the politicization of gaming, before the, you know, hypernormalization of leftoid propaganda as the chief component of our entertainment, not just video games, but everything. You know, we're remaking games just to ruin them in an effort to fix the originals. Remaking children's movies, you know, Disney turning their stable of legacy IPs into hostile, seething race propaganda. Our industry takes its cues now from Hollywood, and Hollywood have been engaging in this kind of cultural vandalism, this salting campaign for decades, and it's about retooling the IPs of the past that were popular remolding them into vessels of critical theory. It's about taking these things and, you know, disfiguring them into something that's kind of recognizable, but ultimately it's not good for you. Nonetheless, it's mixed into our entertainment, kind of like medicine, mixed into our cultural pig feed, right? So that's really where we're at at the moment. And the people producing this stuff, the reason why they have to hijack works of the past and corrupt them into something new is because they can't create new culture outright. It's the reason why they can't meme effectively as well. And you'll notice that everything that they create, quote unquote, is always some kind of parody or satire or twist or subversion of something that was once great. They saw something that was working and functioning, institutions and a system and a social game that allowed you know, people to actually prosper and they say, we hate this, right? So, you know, we want this, but we hate it. So we're gonna steal it, but we hate it. And instead of creating something better or superior, we're gonna turn the entire social game of the West on its head, and we're gonna change the rules so that we can never lose. It's the same pattern. It's like a fractal that repeats itself throughout our modern culture, where you have something that stands alone, that has merit and value, and it's criticized into nothing, and then taken over, then assimilated and turned into the antithesis of what it once stood for. The ethos is completely inverted. And you can take this theory of pause that I'm presenting here, and you can apply it to gaming, you can apply it to Magic the Gathering, Star Wars, you know, speedrunning, religion and identity, biological sex and gender, economics. Nothing is safe from the stochastic terrorism of Marxist critical theory. And there's a real sadism to this process born from, I guess, hatred and envy mixed together, right? And the TLDR on that is that these people are evil. You know, evil cannot create. And if evil ever won, it would simply destroy itself. Because, of course, creating culture of value does require honesty and it requires truth and beauty. And you have to be the type of creator that can actually will these things into existence. And they need to be unrestrained by political censorship, especially censorship being enforced in the name of this woke movement, which is just anti-beauty. It's an anti-human ideology. 
And the people drawn to it, you know, either they're sheep and they're being tricked into destroying the world and themselves, or they're evil, they're psychopaths, or they are simply just, what, the, the belched detritus of society, these bottom-feeding, wretched mutants to whom the act of destruction is like this Freudian orgasm just to tear down and destroy and to see this moral corruption that they feel inside wrought large onto society. There's no greater pleasure for these types of people. So our current status quo hates truth. It hates beauty. It hates honesty. So, you know, it's very difficult for sincere, unironic, grassroots culture to flourish in this current period. It's taboo in the mainstream to be a creator or an artist and not kowtow to the regime. You know, you have to include this woke agenda into your content, into your art. Otherwise, you don't even get a seat at the table. This is the form of gatekeeping that they engage in, where your career will be completely nipped in the bud unless you are down for being a political and, frankly, a spiritual prostitute. And yet I still have people telling me, eh, well, look at you with your nostalgia goggles, you millennial boomer. Everything's always been terrible, you know. Society's always been terrible. Video games have always been terrible. And it's my nostalgia that's clouding my judgment, you know, because I'm romanticizing the past. You know, that's what nostalgia really is. It's spiritual boomers pedestalizing the slop of their generations, you know. Only an idiot would say that. Only a Redditor or a just ignorant Zoomer who just doesn't know any better would say that. Because guys, this cope in particular, it's like a Soviet-style cope, right? It's like the Communist Party telling everybody that things have always been like this, that the party's always been in power and, you know, <laughs> we're going to edit history so that we can prove to everybody that even if everything sucks, it's always sucked. And you remembering things that were tangibly better, objectively superior, not 15, 20 years ago, well, at best, that's your mind playing tricks on you. And at worst, it's evidence that you are some kind of dissident and we should be dealing with you, re-educating you, or possibly just throwing you into a gulag. Soviet-style propaganda doesn't really function. Marxist-style propaganda cannot really take root properly unless you erase history, you erase the culture of the past. Because of course, communism sucks, Marxism sucks. Equity is fucking cancer because it just destroys creativity. It takes things that should be ascendant and it just drags them down into the dirt to be mocked, to be spat upon for the most sick materialist reasons you can imagine. Beauty cannot flourish in a society where these kinds of ideologues are in power. And gaming from back in my heyday is just evidence of how far things have truly fallen. Like, we have fallen in the West as a people. Our culture is now an anti-culture, used only to harm and to influence negatively the, the actual varied cultures of the world and assimilate them into our gay disco of a society which is also on fire, right? So, you know, we live in a gay disco that's on fire. And this is normal. There's nothing to be concerned about. In fact, if you personally are concerned about making it out of the gay disco alive, then you are now an object of suspicion because things have never been better than they are now and things will never be better than they are now. As we've seen with the MAGA movement in all of its cringe and impotent glory, I mean, just to hope for a better day is now considered like political hate speech by the establishment. Because, you know, nostalgia in this current era is a little bit problematic, really, because again, any nostalgia is anti-progressive because progressivism kind of hinges on the idea that change is not only preferred, but it's morally necessary to correct the ills of the past. And anyone seen to be lionizing the works and the history of this previous order, well, you are making a political statement even if you don't realize it. Because guys, I mean, I'm, I'm old as shit. I was actually there during the golden age of gaming and I can confirm to you, without any kind of nostalgia goggles or anything like that, things were better. The market was freer, it was healthier, and the fact is, I mean, games were being produced by people who loved video games, not by people who, if you gave them their way, they'd like genocide half of the fucking country, right? 
Which just highlights the absurdity of all these hardcore, like, trans Marxists operating within an industry that is, <laughs> it's an entertainment industry. And yet, they're all about praxis, they're all about the agenda. And it's like, guys, you, you, you don't even believe in capitalism, you don't even believe in supply and demand. And yet they're being employed by companies like Blizzard, you know, <laughs> like they want to smash capitalism in the West and the patriarchy. And they're going to do that, but they're also going to need my money too, because again, they just produced The Last of Us Part 3, Piss Christ, and I'm supposed to pay for that so that they can more effectively destroy my future and my children's future, free from anything resembling an entertaining video game, right? So this is very different from the libertarian arms race of classic gaming, where it was all about dazzling the consumer, you know, they were fighting for that market share of your attention. Squaresoft would come out with these insane tech demos and then they'd completely blow your mind with the FMV graphics. You'd be like, wow, I've never seen anything like this. And then, you know, people at work or at school would be talking about the new Halo game. I had like teachers at my school talking about Halo Combat Evolved. It was just such a big deal. At a time when giving young men like the red meat that they want in their entertainment wasn't seen as controversial, it was seen as an obvious business decision. And there was a lot of joy, there was a lot of positivity within the community during this time. Now, I never played the Zelda games growing up, but I always wanted to. I always was jealous of my friends at school that had N64s because Ocarina of Time was just such a killer app for that console, but also for my generation, it's a seminal game. You know, it's possibly one of the greatest games ever made, I, I've been hearing. And I'm finally getting around to playing it now, specifically the Steam Deck version of the Ship of Harkinian hack, which is 60 frames per second. It's widescreen. The second stick on the deck controls the third person camera. There's been some really awesome quality of life improvements. And, you know, for a first playthrough, this is a great version to um, jump into. But, you know, I got to say, there's something really, really profound about this game, just the way it starts. Zelda is the monomyth. This is what I'm understanding now. It's that Nintendo, they stripped down what it meant to have like an adventure game and having a protagonist. They stripped that down to its absolute foundation, which is the human psychological monomyth. This archetypal wellspring from which the meta story of humanity is drawn. Specifically, the Western European incarnation of this story, you know, aesthetically and also in terms of values. Values of truth and of bravery and wisdom. These are the inherent qualities of Link, right? The protagonist. And he's called Link because he is the link between civilizations and, you know, his actions reverberate throughout time and there's this cyclic rising and falling of hillian civilization but always with the hero with this green tunic hero of time stepping into the fore reincarnated time and time again as the vanquisher of evil and of lies and deceit right and that's ganon both the pure evil form of ganon but also the man ganon because evil takes many forms you know evil can be bestial and unknowable and evil can be familiar, right? So that's kind of how I've, I've just got to the section where Princess Zelda introduces Ganondorf to Link and explains that although the court and the king have been taken in by the lies of this very mysterious, you know, charismatic, manipulative desert gypsy, Princess Zelda can see the evil within and, you know, Link, although still just a child, you know, his call to adventure is this quest given to him by this divine princess. She is not just any princess, right? She has a connection to the Triforce. She is this holy princess representing purity and truth and goodness. And that's something worth fighting for. That's something worth going on a quest for. So again, this game is just like, it's slamming you over the head with basedness. And it makes it look easy, you know what I mean? Playing this game in 2023 is very refreshing, and it just reminds me that things could be so much better. It's not just about nostalgia. It's not just about looking to the past and going, oh, everything sucks, you know? It's about recognizing what was great about our history and our culture and building on it, you know, and looking towards a future where we can have both. We can have the best of both worlds. We can have the wisdom of the past working in tandem 
with the technology of the future, you know, a positive futurism where there's a place for this elemental spirituality stuff that's infused into the video games of the 90s. We took it for granted because, unfortunately, we don't live in that timeline. You know, we live in the dark future. This is the future that Link was trying to prevent. Too bad we didn't have a hero of time because we live in the Marxist bugman panopticon. And as far as Zelda goes, the subject matter is taboo in the modern industry. The idea of playing as this kind of like Aryan avatar, this fairy boy called to adventure by divine providence, by destiny, and to vanquish evil once and for all, this ancient evil, you know? Like Miyamoto-san, cool it with the anti-Semitism. 